This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. The Moral Maze and its presenter are frequently applauded for being robust, provocative and engaging. But many say Michael Burke overstepped the mark this week before the programme even went out. Nobody comes out of the Chet Evans rape case with any credit. Not the victim who drank so much he could barely stand, nor the two footballers who had sex... At the extreme, it kind of implied that she was somehow responsible for the outcome. Another Michael is also in the firing line this week, one of any questions frequent panellists, Lord Heseltine. And his offence? You can subsidise wages to get handicapped people into the marketplace, into the workplace. I was really outraged by the use of the word handicapped. The word is from a time when people with disabilities were treated as second-class citizens. Peter White is here to guide us through the linguistic minefield he has to negotiate in his job as the BBC's disability affairs correspondent. I'll also ask Peter if he is blind or visually impaired. The BBC wants more visible and audible ethnic diversity on air, so it's running a series of training days to try to make it happen. We talked to two black professionals keen to have a go. I don't say I want to be an expert in order that you put me only in an ethnic market. I would love to present on spring lambing too. That's true. I, I don't like the idea of being a BAME expert, as though that's somehow a different kind of expert. I don't want to be the black psychology expert. I'm just a psychology expert. But first, more on the art, or is it the pugilistic science of the political interview? Last week at the radio festival in Salford, John Humphreys put up a staunch defence of the adversarial approach in calling our elected representatives to account. If you know you've got five or six minutes, you've got to, and I'm putting this gently, you've got to hurry them along at very least. And, and this is the crucial thing, and I do think most listeners accept this, if they are not answering your question quite deliberately because it's a difficult question for them, then, yes, you're going to push them much harder than you would if you had that nice, long, gentle, analytical interview. Did the Grand Inquisitor's counterpunches enable him to win on points? Many of you were keen to get in the ring with him. Michael Hooton, Isle of Anglesey. Very interesting item on the art of the political interview with John Humphreys, although I could barely contain my annoyance with his disingenuous remarks about the style of interviewing that is now prevalent and his part in it. My name is Leslie Clark. I've just been listening to the interview with John Humphreys. I don't like it. I've never liked his interviewing style. I've never felt informed by it. There are people who actually have excellence in interviewing styles, and he certainly does not. Michael Sherratt from Tring in Hertfordshire. John's a very famous interviewer and does a terrific job, but in fact he's now exemplifying the sort of interviewing where the interviewer tries to break down the will of the interviewee to live. So what I'd like to see is this less of this bombastic interviewing and more sensitive, educated sort of interviewing. And those of you who feel political interviews are often just a brawl, with both sides shouting over each other, say there was a prime example on Monday's Today programme, when Sarah Montague locked horns with the usually affable Tory Europhile and former Chancellor Ken Clark. My right-wing colleague okay, uh, and but, my but local hospital does recruit Romanian okay, nurses. They're extremely good. Something... Uh, but we must get back to... Bobby Vincent Emery from London. Sarah Montague talked over Ken Clark. This is not a good interviewing technique. I was none the wiser, unfortunately, but I think Ken Clark had some interesting information that many people would have wanted to hear. Well, that's why we stopped. If, okay. if you so think there, our so there isn't that a problem. generous so compared with the French, we've tightened that up. Okay. So, so to that. Be... David Moore speaking from Hamhaw Island. It came across to me as if she was just trying to score points in a game of one-upmanship, and that's not really what I want to hear. I want to hear what a politician's reply is, having been asked the question. But Radio 4 listeners belong to a broad church, and there are some of you who feel the fault lies not with the interviewers, but with the politicians. Phil Jones, Red Car. If a politician repeatedly fails to directly answer questions by the media, do not interview them again for a period of time. They will soon get the hint. It's the job of the interviewer to get the truth from the politicians, and it's the job of the politicians to be honest with the people who they are working on behalf of. Daniel Smith, and I'm from Leicester. John Humphreys is a good interviewer. In my humble opinion, I think it better to go to an interview with the gloves off and turn the other cheek when they start getting defensive. The one thing we know about politicians 
is they fall out with themselves quicker than the BBC. Really? Well, at least in a boxing match there's a referee who can penalise the fighters or disqualify them. Is there a third way between aggression and submission? Is there a crisis in political interviewing? Or was it ever thus? Do tell us what you think and whether you have a remedy. Contact details coming up later. Now, it's not true that BBC presenters and producers live in fear of a call from feedback asking them onto the programme. But some do seem to think we and you might be waiting for them to make a mistake. Here, for instance, is Jonathan Dimbleby at the end of last week's Any Questions. Next week, we're going to be in Brecon or near Brecon at the Theatre Brookin Yog. Complaints about my pronunciation, please, to feedback. Um, on our panel, the member of the Welsh Assembly, Reen Up Your Waith. Sorry, Reen. Chair of the Public In fact, Welsh feedback listeners must be a forgiving bunch, as not one got in touch with us to pick Jonathan up on his pronunciation. Other listeners did, though, complain about something else within the programme. Panellists were discussing Lord Freud's tape-recorded comments that he thought it worth considering whether people with disabilities could be paid less than the minimum wage. Lord Heseltine then used a word some thought had long been consigned to the do-not-use bin. You can subsidise wages to get handicapped people into the marketplace, into the workplace. Lurtha Mile from Leeds in West Yorkshire. I was really outraged by the use of the word handicapped. I believe that the word is from a time when people with disabilities were treated as second-class citizens. Patrick McDermott, the use of the word handicapped by Lord Heseltine is totally unacceptable. Why was he not corrected? Will you not accept some sort of subsidisation in order to help the handicapped people into work? And I think perhaps it is appropriate for the producers of programmes to, to make a stand and maybe step in and say perhaps that is not an appropriate word to use. So, why did the chairman, Jonathan Dimbleby, not intervene? Any questions told us? When deciding whether to challenge a contributor on their use of an outdated word such as handicapped in a live discussion programme, we consider the contributor's intention and how offensive the word is to the general public in the particular circumstances. In this case, it was not deemed necessary to pick Michael Heseltine up on his use of the word in a positive discussion about disability, as there was no intention to offend and any interjection would have disrupted the flow of the debate. So, a difficult judgment call on a live programme, but one they haven't had second thoughts about as the broadcast was repeated, unedited, the next day. One man well-versed in using the correct terminology in covering these issues is the BBC's disability affairs correspondent, Peter White. I asked him whether he thought the word handicapped is offensive. To a lot of people, it is. It has to be said, you can get into very involved debates about what that actually means, what the derivation is, whether the derivation is offensive. But in the end, once a word has become offensive to people, it's become offensive. But, of course, this is a generational thing. And I don't suppose it's become offensive to Lord Heseltine because he was brought up in a generation when it was the word that was automatically used. So if you were the presenter of any questions on that occasion, would you have corrected and intervened and corrected Michael Heseltine? No, I wouldn't. Uh, quite regardless of, you know, the views being expressed and whether you agree with them or not, that debate had got to a point where I don't think it would have been appropriate to correct him. I mean, the most important thing to say is, had a presenter, had it been Jonathan who said it, then, of course, there would have been a case for saying, because it's very clearly in BBC guidelines that this is a word that does offend uh, quite a lot of disabled people, it would have been appropriate to perhaps wrap Jonathan over the knuckles. But not, I don't think, different rules apply for guests. They come, they give their views. I don't think it's for the BBC to dictate to people the terminology they use. So I don't think it would have been appropriate there. So they can tell the presenters, but they should not necessarily tell their guests what language to use. I, I think that's right. I mean, I think quite apart from anything else, it's an issue of good manners. You invite people to come on and you invite them to express their views. You don't believe for one moment that everybody is going to agree with those views or perhaps agree with the terminology they use. Clearly, there comes a point when you're in breach of the law or you're being grossly offensive. But I think there's a difference between using a word that a lot of people don't like and being grossly 
offensive. The other issue, of course, is what the intention was. If a word is clearly and is intended to be offensive, that's different. I would say, as in lots of situations in the law, intention is crucial. Well, for a lot of people get very nervous about uh, what language they should use. For example, I've got in front of me the 10 most offensive words to describe people with disabilities taken from a survey, albeit in 2003. The 10th one is wheelchair-bound. Yeah. Now, there are quite a lot of people who would say, that's purely descriptive. What's Mm. wrong with that? Well, I think what is wrong with it in people's mind is that it has all sorts of connotations of passivity and the fact that you're just sitting there and being uh, done to. And what people would prefer, but not all people, of course, is to say a wheelchair user. There's a difference between being bound to it and using it as a mobility aid, which is what a wheelchair is. So... I understand that, but I think the point, what you have to say is these surveys, or indeed decisions made by organisations which represent disabled people, don't have any overall validity. I mean, people talk as if there is a community of disabled people out there all thinking the same thing. It's just not true. People have got hugely... I'll give you a very personal example. I present in touch, as some people will know. We quite often use the term visually impaired because it is largely accepted. I don't like the term. Well, you prefer blind? Yeah because that's what I am. It's a good old-fashioned Anglo-Saxon term, I am blind. I would rather say blind or partially sighted, because that covers most people. They're either one or the other. If you want to use the cup half full, cup half empty, you could say partially sighted or partially blind. But the fact is, you are one one or the other of those. But why, should like that, that. why should people have been upset by the use of the term blind and wanted to find something else? What is it about that word? blind that they find offensive. I think part of the problem with the word is the fact that it's often used to describe an inability, you know, blind to their faults. It's often used in language as indicating sort of some lack of ability, a bit of obtuseness or so forth. But the fact of the matter is, of course, that it is a very accurate description. I I don't have any vision. I don't have any sight. And blind describes me. The RNIB like to talk, for example, now about um, people with sight loss. Well, I don't have sight loss. You, never I had it you can't in the first lose place. what you didn't have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you worried, though, that the sensitivity about language may lead to even the most confident and professional of interviewers being reluctant, perhaps, to use certain language, be specific? Here's an example on the Today programme of John Humphreys being surprisingly hesitant for him. I'm going to put this you know, without falling into the, 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 uh. the Lord Freud trap. She, um, she can't do what. <laughs> People could what, do what you and I. What you and I right. could do e- exactly. Like. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, uh, yeah, I heard that, and of course, it, because it was John Humphreys, you tend to think, well, if even John Humphreys is finding it hard to talk about this subject, then we're in trouble because that would be my fear about this: that if we become too prescriptive about language, then what we start to do is make people afraid to raise subjects, and that's one of the things disabled people also complain about, which is that people won't deal with the subject. Well, people won't deal with the subject if they're frightened that they're actually going to find themselves in trouble over the words they use. However, there are some things which are definitely unacceptable. And so if anybody now used a word I used to hear in my youth, cripple, that would really be offensive. People do find it offensive. Unfortunately, that is the word which quite often disabled people themselves use with each other in terms of, you know, what the phrase used is taking over the language. So that does get used in the same way as black people use certain terms in exactly that kind of way. It really is this, a very complicated situation. And we have to be careful. If somebody's making the rules, we ought to know who they are and what authority they have to make them. Our thanks to the BBC's Disability Affairs correspondent, Peter White. And do let us know your views on that issue or anything else to do with BBC Radio. To let you know how, here's Peter again. You can write to feedback. That's P.O. Box 67234, London, SE1 P 4 AX, or leave a phone message on 03 treble 3 treble 4 five double four. Standard landline charges apply, but it could cost more on some mobile networks. Or send an email to feedback at bbc.co.uk and you can tweet at BBC R4 Feedback. All those details are on the website. Now, the moral maze thrives on controversial ethical dilemmas. 
What it's not used to is finding itself and its presenter at the centre of a storm of protest before it's even been on air. It all started on Wednesday morning with Michael Burke's live trail into the Today programme. Nobody comes out of the Chet Evans rape case with any credit. Not the victim who'd drunk so much he could barely stand, nor the two footballers who had sex with her in the most sordid of circumstances. A great many people on Twitter and beyond took immediate offence to what they thought was the implication that the victim of the rape was partly to blame for what happened, because she was drunk. My name is Julia Cox and I'm from Milton Keynes. I heard the trailer for The Moral Maze this morning on the Radio 4 Today programme. What what upset me most was the comparison. That was what annoyed me about that opening statement. At the extreme, it kind of implied that she was somehow responsible for the outcome. My name's Jackie Close, and I'm from Newcastle. From the very start of the trail, I was quite shocked by it. The suggestion that in some way she's culpable in her own rape as far as I'm aware, it's not. There's no prescribed limit to the amount of drink you can have while being in charge of being a woman. Seeing this strength of feeling online, the programme's producer, Phil Pegum, tweeted an apology a few hours later. Apologies for the wording of today's moral maze trail. There was no intention to suggest the victim was in any way at fault. Tabloids and broadsheets alike leapt on the story, and the next time we heard from Michael... Promoting the moral maze in his trail in the PM programme, his script had changed. It's one of the ground rules of our society that when a criminal has paid his penalty, served his sentence, he can put the past behind him, try to pick up a normal life. Three things are different about the Chet Evans case. So how had the original trail got on air? Michael Burke, unlike some others, writes his own trails. Had a producer seen it before it was delivered? Radio 4 was not prepared to answer such questions. Instead, they gave us this statement. There was no intention to suggest that the victim was in any way at fault, and we apologise if the way this live trail was phrased suggested this. This week's Moral Maze asks whether a convicted rapist who maintains his innocence should be entitled to get his job back. And as for the programme itself, by contrast it was a relative oasis of calm. Plenty of lively debate in the studio and online, but Michael was careful not to add any fuel to the fire with more, um, intemperate language. However, he did appear on Five Live the next day in somewhat contrite mood. I I suppose the first thing to say is that uh, that if if people took from it um, the, the impression that I was blaming the victim for the rape, that was absolutely not my intention. Uh, And therefore, if people got that impression, it's something I need to uh, apologise for. Now, music to the ears of some, perhaps most Radio 3 listeners. Those that are still listening, the latest figures show the audience has dropped by 5.6% in the last year to 1.91 million. The controller-elect Alan Davey was on the Today programme on Wednesday in his role as the outgoing Chief Executive of Arts Council England. But he was keen to reassure worried listeners that he had no intention of taking Radio 3 down market. If you look at what I've done at the Arts Council, it's not been about dumbing down, it's been about wising up. It's about putting on Stockhausen's Mittwoch aus Licht in a way that's intelligent and explains it, and that got an, an a, 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 a thrilled audience in Birmingham uh, because you do complex culture properly and it makes sense to people. Well, Alan Davy isn't due to take up his post at Radio 3 until the new year. Our bid to interview him is already in. But in the meantime, we're more than happy to air your views on the station and whether it needs to change to attract more listeners. Now, the BBC thinks there is still too high a proportion of white male experts on its programmes and that too often they come from a privileged Southern English background. In other words, they do not reflect the diversity of the UK population. So what is the corporation doing about it? This month, the BBC Academy started a drive to increase the pool of black and minority ethnic experts, that's B-A-M-E for short, which producers can call upon for their programmes. Across the country, Black and Minority Ethnic Expert Voices Days, that's a mouthful, are taking place to train up the brightest and the best in their differing fields to become some of the future voices and faces of the BBC. That's fantastic, yeah. But can we get the eyes to me? I see you, OK. Yeah. That's all right. 
I know you've just been presenting. That's all right. I'll, I'll do that. I see you then. Um, so yes, where, where should I start again? Tim again. So we, we showed up this morning in the BBC. I'm the BBC's target for BAME portrayal on air by 2017 is 15%, which reflects the UK population as a whole. The current BBC percentage is 10.4%. Hoping to contribute to a more diverse BBC are food lawyer Gail Walters and lecturer in psychology at Goldsmiths University of London, Dr Keon West. They're both originally from Jamaica. I began by asking Gail why colour and ethnicity matter. Surely the most important thing is ability. If we were able to always see ability without colour, then it wouldn't matter. But we are, we are made up of all our parts, our ability and our colour. It's important to recognise that and to acknowledge it. And Dr West? I'd say what matters most about me to me is my ability, but I agree with what Gail says in that we don't see ability independent of colour. So I think when most people say what matters is ability, not colour, they think that what we're doing is giving a chance to some women or some BME people who aren't that good to be on the same platform as white people or men who are that good. And that is completely contrary to all the data that we have. The data that we have shows that when graduate students send 100 emails to professors asking for advice, if 50 of them are sent by the men and 50 are sent by the women, the men get a much higher response rate. If 50 are sent by white people and 50 are sent by black people, the white people get a much higher response rate, despite the fact that the email is the same. So what good can the sort of training that the BBC is giving do for you? Because the suggestion is actually the BBC needs to train itself rather than train you. Well, it's, it's a two-way street. It is a partnership. The BBC will pick what it knows, and the BBC know, only knows a particular thing because that has been its, its history. On the day, my experience was that there was a mutualism happening. There was an exchange. It was the BBC learning, and it was the, the BME experts learning. It always has to be recognised that this is a partnership, not one dictating to the other. On the question of confidence, Dr West, I think it's quite interesting that, that both of you come from and were educated, not in this country, in Jamaica, in a society where you were not in a minority. There's no magical thing that happens with women or black people that protects us from the negative messages of our society. So if we don't see experts that look like us on television or don't hear them on the radio then we grow up thinking we can't do that. And because we both grew up as majority members, all the doctors and lawyers and prime ministers we knew were black people, we assumed we could be anything we wanted. But I have met white people here in England who say, I have never seen a black expert before I met you. And I've met children who've told me, I did not know that I could be what you are. And when you run the numbers, you run the analyses, they tend to show the same thing. So the more white people watch television the more negative their stereotypes of black people are, but also the more black people watch television, the lower their self-esteem is. So there's something that's happening where you're giving people an implicit message that certain people belong in certain roles and other people belong in different roles. And we are not immune to that effect at all. Gail, do you think there's a particular problem, though, with commissioners? In other words, the power matters, the commissioning power yes. matters. And if you, you can have all the highly qualified and uh, yes. presenters you want, but unless the commissioners are also drawn from those different backgrounds, you're not going to get very far, are you? You're correct. It does require diversity on both sides of the table. The power has to be spread. It has to be diverse. Diversity is not about exclusion. It is about inclusion and recognising that we actually are, are common. There's a common humanity. So I don't say I want to be an expert in order that you put me only in an ethnic market. I would love to present on spring lambing too. That's true. I, I don't like the idea of being a BAME expert, as though that's somehow a different kind of expert. I don't want to be the black psychology expert. I'm just a psychology expert. The BBC has a target of getting to about 15%, I think, of people on air yeah. who are from black and minority ethnic backgrounds, which broadly reflects the population as a whole. Yeah. If it does that, can it sit back and say, hey, we don't need to do anything else? No, absolutely it not. It never absolutely should. Not. No. The BBC is in the public trust, and that's what makes it amazing. I'm a BBC file, and the BBC should never sit back and relax. It should always be seeking to educate and inform. And it does that by including everyone. Gail, about people in this country from black and minority ethnic backgrounds who don't have your qualifications and maybe don't have your confidence, how do you help them forward? This is one way. The value of seeing yourself represented somewhere is disproportionate in respect to the education that you have. And until you see yourself represented, you can't think of being it. 
I'll have to agree with that too, and I'll give you two stories on it. One is an experiment that was done in 2009, the year Barack Obama was elected. African Americans tend to do worse than the white American counterparts in school, and they found that the more exposure there was to Barack Obama in the news media for a very short period of time, the better black students did on specifically verbal assessment. I don't think this is because they were learning things from his speeches. I think it was because it occurred to them that black people can be eloquent, and so they shifted their perceptions of themselves. And the second story is from my students. So every year I ask them where they want to be in 10 years. And black students in the UK are notoriously bad at imagining themselves in academia. And that's because academia has almost no black people. But when I'm teaching them, it's more likely, and I can see it, I've had black students look at me and say, I want to be where you are. And I see that you can do it. So I think I can do it too. And that makes a difference. And by appearing here and by being visible, we let them know that such things are possible. So if we do get a higher, a much higher representation of black and minority ethnic people in front of the microphone. What will that mean to the ordinary listener, do you think? It will open the ordinary listener's world. And when I say the ordinary listener, that listener is X. It's not black, it's not white, it's not Asian, it's just X. And his world, her world, will be expanded. And will it be expanded because the range of references and the range of subject matters will automatically expand? Or will it change in some other way? It will widen in the range of what is presented. It will widen in the range of what you see and what you can imagine. So there will be perhaps empirical studies that you can do, but there will always be psychological or emotional ones that you can't pinpoint, but you will see their effects it actually increases the benefit for everyone in that the best people, not just the most male people or the whitest people, get to be at the table. It makes it better for everyone in that sense and that you actually hear the best voices. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, that's just about it for this week. But next week, we have a treat for hi-fi technophiles as we investigate BBC Radio's venture into surround sound and binaural audio. In particular, how they jazzed up this recent broadcast of Under Milk Wood. Will you take this woman, Matthew Richards? Chelsea Preveron, Effie Bevan, Lil the Gloopot, Mrs. Flusher, Bloodwen Bowen, to be your awful wedded wife? No! 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 no. Well, if you were listening to that on your old mono wireless set, you may not have noticed anything special. But if you have the necessary kit, try listening back on stereo headphones and tell us what you think. Of course, you would not wish to hear my voice in surround sound. One of me is quite enough. Goodbye. <laughs>